welcome you all back to this uh, course on defects in material. Okay. Uh, last class we had covered about the different type of dislocations, the screw dislocation, niche dislocation, mixed dislocation, frank dislocation, <coughs> how to define the bias vector of the dislocation. And before that we have come out of stress and strain field, uh, uh, how they are defined in the tensorial notation, okay. All the relationship amongst the components, that is what we have covered. Today's class, what we will do is that when a material contains a defect, okay, how do we find out the stress and strain field around a defect? The defect which we are going to consider is a dislocation, okay. The simplest type of dislocations which we can consider are a screw and an edge dislocation, okay. So, what is the methodology which we have to follow to find out information about the stress and strain field around the dislocation? We have seen that whenever uh, stress or strains are around a dislocation, okay, there is some dynamic equilibrium is uh, there in that sample. So, we have to find out the equilibrium equation governing that. That we have looked at it in the last class, okay. That equation is essentially was written in terms of uh, uh, stress and displacement. But from what we know about the how the stress can be related to strain and strain can be related to displacement, that equation itself can be written in the form of a displacement. And that is nothing but a wave equation. Now we have to find a solution to that wave equation that will give you the displacement which the atom is going to atom at a particular lattice point is uh, uh, if a displacement takes place what are how the displacement should be uh, uh, written or what will be the solution to a displacement satisfying this force balance equation. Okay. Once we know the displacements okay, then the rate of change of displacement will give the strain okay. and using generalized Hooke's law from this strain we can calculate the stress field. That is essentially the philosophy which is being followed to calculate the stress and strain field around the dislocation, okay. So just to recap, let us go back to look at that uh, force balance equation, okay. In the force balance equation what we are trying to do, we are considering an infinitesimal uh, cube, okay, where we assume that the stress is varying as a function of position. Right? And then we are representing this variation in stress as a derivative that is for sigma xx the derivative is d uh, uh, dou uh, sigma xx by dx. Okay? And if you take a small cube that essentially this is the cube and the center of the taxi system is essentially taken with respect to this cube and then this will be half the distance, okay. So from here if we take it how the stress is going to vary and on each of the faces we can find out what will be the stress here. If this is x, here it is x, y is that this coordinate system which we follow because we will, uh, it will become clear why we follow this coordinate system, okay. With respect to this coordinate system, at the center if it is sigma xx is the tensile stress. So on this surface it will be sigma xx plus into uh, xx mu, okay, into some delta x because this total distance is delta x so half of it and similarly on that is what the stress is going to be and the normal stress on the other side will be sigma xx minus half into delta x right. This is what essentially is being written here this is one, one particular direction. Similarly, on the y surface, 
we can see what is going to be the shear stress which is going to act in the x direction. Similarly, on the EZ phase also, what is going to be the shear stress which is going to act which we can find out. If you multiply it by the area, okay, that gives the force which is going to act in this direction and that is being added up. Okay. If there is a net force which is going to be there, that force can be using Newton's law, we can express it in the forms of, because the force balance has to be there, that is, okay, that will be, we can express it in terms of rho, the density into the rate of change of velocity acceleration. That is what this force balances equation essentially is about. Okay. So, this equation will be valid. That is when we write the rate of change of uh, velocity means that there should be a moment of that uh, a body, correct? Otherwise, it will be in a equilibrium where this uh, when the body is in equilibrium, it is static, the right hand side will turn out to be, uh, left hand side will turn out to be 0, correct? Okay. What I have done is that the same equation, okay, substituting for uh, sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma z z z x in terms of the generalized Stokes law which I had been given in the earlier class and then substituting for stress epsilon x x equals uh, du by dx x y will turn out to be dv by dx using these sort of expressions okay if you substitute then we will be able to derive these three equations okay in the uh, absence of body forces there are no forces which are acting on the, the equilibrium condition will be this right hand side will turn out to be zero this is what essentially the expression which we get it okay now we have to find depending upon the situation applying the boundary condition because this is nothing but a wave equation. We have to find out solution to u, v and w which we have to find out. Okay. That will change slightly depending upon what sort of boundary condition which we apply. Now let us look at the case of a, uh, any dislocation. Okay. We wanted to find out a displacement field around it. The first thing which we consider is that dislocation is an infinitely long straight line. That means that in that body it is going across from 1 and 2, it is a very long and we consider it as a straight dislocation. That is the easiest case which we can consider. And it is lying along the Z axis which is being chosen here. Okay. If that is the case, okay, then what is essentially going to happen is that if we consider a point here or a point here or point here, any point on this dislocation line, it is assumed to be identical, correct? It is a long dislocation that is in that case the derivative with respect to Z, there is no variation we assume that with respect to changing from one point to another point in the Z. That means that in the force balance equation all the ones uh, terms which contain, uh, which are uh, derivatives of Z will turn out to be 0. Okay. Now, this is how the equation will turn out to be. Okay. Now, we can see that derivative with respect to only x and y are present. Okay. So, the solution to this equation we have to find out. How do we go about? Okay. Suppose we assume that the dislocation is stationary. In that case, the right hand side becomes 0, correct? And the next is that UVW, if we look at it for a dislocation, any point if we consider, okay, if we take one circuit around it, from the starting point to the end point, when we come back to identical position around the dislocation, a displacement of B always has to come and it should repeat itself. That means that the solution should be essentially that one full circle if we consider it, it should be 
displays a, a lattice translation vector is the displacement and that means that there should be a multivalued function of position. Multivalued function of position can be only trigonometric functions which we can have. Now let us take the case of a screw dislocation. Okay, so far we have considered that the dislocation is a uh, line okay, which is along the z axis. Okay. So that means that this is x y, and this is the z direction and uh, that is what essentially is being shown in this diagram. When we take one circuit around it finally there is a displacement which is by just vector. And the displacement is now only in z direction right. So the component of the displacement if you look at it u and as well as v direction x and y direction that is either in this direction or in this direction there is no displacement. The atomic displacement is taking place only in the z direction. So only the w exists. And what is the nature of w? As we move at an angle from going from one position to the another there is going to be a displacement which gradually increases and as we reach the same point again we find that a displacement of b has to take place. So that can be expressed in the form of b by 2 by okay. tan inverse y by x or if we express it in other way we can write it as tan inverse y by x is nothing but the theta right. And this theta is always expressed in radians that one should remember always. We should never use degrees for this. Now the strains we have to calculate. As I mentioned about the strains using these expressions du by dx okay u is 0. So when u is 0 the terms which correspond to epsilon xx, epsilon yy okay those terms will be 0. The only term which is going to be present in this case is epsilon, epsilon y z as well as epsilon x z okay. And this is how we define these terms okay. Half into this is how this expression will be right. The component of the strain tensor when we represent it this is what it is. Now we take the deriva derivative then it will turn out to be equal to b by 4 pi into x by x squared plus y squared okay. Is clear. Similarly, we can find out for epsilon x z also. Okay. Now, since we know the strain tensor component, now we can find out. Okay. Yeah. Before going further, I should mention that all other terms, epsilon x x, epsilon y y, all other components of the strain, they will turn out to be zero because only the w is there. The only the term which contains w that can be differentiated with respect to x and y only those terms exist for the strain correct. So now if we substitute for and these are all nothing but shear stresses correct. There are no tensile or compressive stresses are there only shear stresses are present around an edge dislocation that one should always remember. Now if we substitute. Uh, for uh, this will be into 2g into epsilon y z. This is from the generalized Hooke's law. Okay, when we substitute, we will be getting an expression of uh, this form. Okay. Similarly, for y z also, we will be getting an expression of a similar form which we are going to get it. Yes. No, we will come to edge dislocation later. 
Now in the screw dislocation, the difference between a screw and an edge is that in the case of a screw dislocation, there are only shear stresses. There are no tensile stresses, okay, not hydrostatic stress. That is going to be there in edge. The edge will come, okay. Other than this, other stress components like sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma is all other components are going to be 0, okay. See, we have used a Cartesian coordinate system, but what we could make out intuitively if you look at it, it has got a uh, circular symmetry around the dislocation line. So, the dislocation itself can be represented in terms of cylindrical coordinates also, right. So, when we use cylindrical coordinates, then we define with respect to if this is a r, okay, and this is the angle theta, okay, so, and this is z, the coordinate system which we choose is r theta z, okay. This you might have studied the transformation from one to the other, okay, from Cartesian to cylindrical to spherical coordinate system. I will not go into a detail, but I will just give what are the important significant results which come out of it, okay. In the cylindrical coordinate system if we use, then what will happen is that the value of the stress, because in the Cartesian coordinate system value of the stress is given in these expressions, okay. Here it will be sigma theta is said only will come, it will turn out to be b by 2 pi into r, okay. This is what essentially and all other terms like sigma r r is said is said theta theta r theta, okay. These terms will all turn out to be just 0, okay. Corresponding to this, we will have a strain for pi m. What can we make out from this? That is the stress field is essentially radial. That is around the dislocation line. That is if suppose the dislocation is like this. Around this if we consider circle, okay, the shear stress is going to be the same. At any point R around it, the same value of the stress field which we get it, value of the stress, correct. What is the another information which we can get out of this? The stress decreases as we go away, that is at a longer distance from the core of the dislocation, from the dislocation line. Now let us see what happens when we come very close to the dislocation core. Then R becomes very small, then the value of this stress can become very high, so high that it can be much above the theoretical shear strength of the material. That just cannot happen, correct? So what is the problem? The problem essentially is that we are applying continuum mechanics to a situation and using generalized Hooke's law which is applicable for strains which are extremely small values. So the distances of the order of a few uh, uh, atomic layers from the core of the dislocation, the displacements are very high. Okay, it is a discrete lattice which we have to continue continuum mechanics cannot be applied. Okay, so that part is called as the core of the dislocation. So because the, the theoretical shear strength generally can be of the order of maybe about something like mu by 30 of this is the order which the theoretical shear strength is which we have derived in the uh, 
few class of cell here. Okay. So because of this reason, this is valid for some value of r. That value of r, what we normally choose as the core of the dislocation. Okay, the core of the dislocation generally is taken to be up to about something like five times the bias vector. Okay, because we should have some units with which we should represent it. So the bias vector is taken as a unit in terms of it. Five times the bias vector is where it has been seen in most of the cases that the stress doesn't reach a value uh, close to that of or equal to that or higher than that of the shear strength. Okay, so we have to choose that value. That will also change from material to material. This value of uh, R, which we have to choose it appro uh, appropriately. Okay. So from this, what we can understand is that what is the essential take-home points about screw dislocation? The stress field is uh, has got the radial symmetry, and it decreases as one by R as we go away from the dislocation. Let us look at the case of a stationary edge dislocation. Okay. In this case, also the dislocation line is assumed to be along the z direction, right? Okay. This is the positive sense of the dislocation which we choose it in this direction. Okay. And here if we take a bias circuit around it, there is going to be a displacement B, correct? When we take one circuit around it, this is the bias vector. And what is the direction in which this displacement is there? This is in the x direction. There in the screw dislocation, the bias vector is in the same direction as the line direction of the dislocation. Here it is perpendicular to the line direction. And intuitively looking at it, we can immediately make out that the displacements are going to be there only in x and y directions, correct? And the z direction, uh, no displacement is segment. So then we have to find a solution to that uh, uh, force balance equation, okay? That is much more complex, okay? finding out the solution, but the solution which has been derived, which is given in the most of the textbooks, any textbook which you can so see, it is given and that is what I had given, okay? both in terms of theta as well as in terms of uh, x and y also. Okay? U and V do exist, okay? the W is always equal to 0. Here you can see that the U essentially, if you look at it, it is tan uh, inverse y by s, r tan y by x. That means that this takes care of the uh, cyclic behavior. And if we uh, differentiate with respect to x, y and z, then we will find that the strains when we try to calculate by taking the derivative, okay, epsilon x z, epsilon y z, epsilon z, z will be equal to 0 then epsilon xx will turn out to be this value. That is gb by 4 pi into 1 minus nu. Okay. This remains a constant term. And then these are all the other terms, y into 3x squared plus y squared by x squared plus y squared the whole squared. Okay. Uh, these are all simple uh, algebraic uh, derivation only. One will be able to get these expressions. Okay. One does not have to remember this expression, but one should know that these are all the expressions which one can see it in any book and that value. Okay. If we have this value, okay, from this using generalized Hooke's law, we can find out the stress. Okay. That is what essentially has been given and the calculated value of stress or the derived value of stress is given here. Okay. And uh, one should note that Though the strain is zero, okay, sigma is said, is said exists. Okay, this comes from the uh, uh, Poisson's uh, this one. That's when there's a stress. Okay, 
that is clear and only sigma x is z and y is z is not there. Sigma x y is there, shear stress only in the x y plane, correct. Whereas in the y plane as well as in the x plane, there are tensile compressive stresses are present. Then in the z direction also, there is a stress which is present, okay. These are all the stresses which are present. Now what we will do it is that try to just find out the distribution of each of these stresses, each of this component of the stress sigma xx, let us see how it is distributed around the uh, dislocation. Sigma xx is nothing but around the dislocation, what is going to be the stress? It could be either tensile or a compressive stress. That is around the full dislocation, we are trying to find out what sort of, intuitively we know that with respect to a dislocation when it is present, okay, if this is the slip plane, on the top half of it, it is going to be compressive stress and the bottom half of it, it is going to be a tensile stress, correct. But this intuition tells only that either compressive or tensile, but it does not give the magnitude, correct. When you have to do any quantification, we should know what is going to be the magnitude of it as a function of different distances around the dislocation, correct. That is what these expressions help us to get that information. So for any quantification, we require these values. Now let us look at it. Here, sigma xx is plotted, okay, this is x and this is y and it is plotted at a distance from the center as these dashed circles which are there are in terms of by just vectors the distances are given. From the center of the core of the dislocation, this is 10, 20, 30, 40 like this, 50, okay. And then we are trying to find out what is going to be the stress which is calculated, but now the stress is being given, these are all tensile or uh, compressive stress is given as say equicontour plot, okay. So different values, what we have done, we can normalize this stress by dividing it by gb by 2 pi into 1 minus nu, okay. That is what essentially is being taken some value and then it will be just a numerical factor these terms will turn out to be and that could be either positive or negative. When it is negative, these values, then the stress is going to be compressive and this side is, that is uh, on the positive side of y, the stress is essentially compressive stress, negative side of y, right, that is, this is the negative side of y, okay, the stress is essentially tensile and this is the plane and it changes from the positive to negative. So the line corresponding to y equals 0 that is what corresponds to a 0 stress. Okay. And another aspect also which we have to see it is that the radial symmetry has been lost. If I try to calculate stress around it in the case of a screw dislocation the value remains that same shear stress. Here now you see that at this particular point if you consider this is for a particular distance, the uh, stress turns out to be some factor of 20 minus. And here also, just above it also, that same value you get it. But in between at an angle, at a larger distance, we get this 20. Or the same value of R if we consider here, the value of stress is going to be much higher. So around this, the stress is not the same, it is going to vary, okay. From this, what we are able to make out is that quantitatively we have got some express, uh, plot, quantitative plot, a map which shows how the stress is varying as a function of uh, uh, R as well as theta, correct. But the essential general point which we can take it is uh, uh, below the slip plane, it is uh, tensile 
and above the slip plane it is compressive correct. Now this is with respect to sigma xx let us take with respect to sigma yy okay. With respect to sigma yy if you try to see how the stress is varying okay. Here one can see that uh, because this is uh, given in terms of uh, cylindrical as well as the both the Cartesian coordinate. Above the slip plane and below the slip plane if you consider it that is just at the slip plane the value of stress is 0 okay across the slip plane where y equals 0. And that is because here y if you put it as a, a value 0 the stress is going to be a 0 value correct from this expression we get it. But since this is x squared minus y squared is there for all values of x equals y also this term will turn out to be 0. So that is what this line and this line represent. So not only at uh, uh, the, uh, corresponding to a slip plane or on the x axis but at angle making 45 degrees with rest to x axis there also the stresses become 0. In between if we see in this quadrant it is essentially a uh, the values are positive when the values are positive what is it going to be it is going to be a tensile stress correct and then from here to in this region in this uh, in this uh, arc if we consider here it is all uh, compressive stress again a tensile stress here here again a compressive stress and in this region a tensile stress this is how it is varying okay. So here what we have plotted only just sigma yy correct that is though here the displacement is only in the x direction if we consider anywhere this means that there is going to be a small displacement in the x and there is going to be a small displacement in the y direction also correct. That is all it essentially means you just look at this uh, uh, figure for a moment. In this figure you can make out that this is one circular symmetry okay and if you take the budget circuit like this you can see that it is at any particular point with respect to a point if you consider it there is a displacement both x and y which is going to be there okay. We will come back to it later okay. Now we just look at sigma yy okay. So depending upon the value of theta okay even on the same side okay we can see that there are compressive as well as tensile stresses are present because this is also in the uh, plane which is the y plane the plane perpendicular to y direction right. Now let us look at the case uh, in the x y plane what is going to be there so that is essentially the shear stress which we are considering sigma x y okay. Here again if you look at the expressions this expression and the expression for shear stress except for this term x becomes y otherwise they are identical expression. So a similar behavior is expected. So here again if we see okay, only thing which we can see now is that along the y direction okay, the sigma y sigma x y the shear stress becomes 0 then with 45 degrees with respect to x axis it becomes 0 okay. and in between depending upon between uh, uh, here between plus 45 to minus 45 the stress is always going to be shear stress is always positive okay then between 45 plus 45 to 90 it is going to be negative like this we can make out that the stress is going to change shear stress is going to change correct. So now we have considered only a shear stress component. Now let us look at this case okay 
overall so what we have looked at is sigma xx that is perpendicular to the z direction that is if we consider a plane which is perpendicular to a z direction we have find out the stress in the y direction sigma yy stress in this direction sigma xx we have looked at it and also a shear stress which is going to be sigma xy we have looked at this correct this is all with respect to any point perpendicular to z direction this plot just is a combination of all of them okay there we had given some values okay here what have we done here we have divided into eight quadrants okay around the dislocation core suppose we assume a small region around the dislocation core in this quadrant okay a small cube we assume what are the types of stresses which it will be facing if you look at it and this face perpendicular to the x direction it fa it is feeling a compressive stress perpendicular to the y direction it is a tensile stress and then in this direction the positive direction it is a shear stress which is positive right because on the positive half it is positive so it's positive in this quadrant if you look at it the stress is essentially now the shear stress is reversed it is negative and we look at uh, the uh, y direction it is again compressive in the along the x direction again it is compressive so these stresses which they feel overall all the stress components of the stresses they change direction okay different quadrants this is the different type of stresses which uh, different regions will be feeling okay this is a qualitative way in which we can easily understand the same each of the component in the previous slides we have just plotted each of them separately correct this is the sum of this is something like a plane strain condition where along the z direction any direction along the dislocation we look at it perpendicular to that plane what all the in the plane which is perpendicular to it on that plane what all stresses which are going to act that's what we have tried to calculate okay <coughs> this is essentially to show what is the sort of a displacement this is a bijer circuit around a perfect crystal okay now from the displacement equation for the different values of x and y we can calculate what will be the a value of the position okay of the point or from the original point how it is displaced that is what essentially is being plotted okay now let us look at the case of uh, because so far we considered all the stresses which are in the uh, perpendicular to z okay let us look at the stress sigma z z which is going to act on the sample this stress can be considered as similar to something like a hydrostatic stress okay there is a relationship between them that is mapping up z z and the hydrostatic uh, pressure around an edge dislocation are similar and we know that the hydrostatic stress is given by 1 by 3 into sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 correct <coughs> we can substitute for this okay and to try to solve this equation then this sigma will turn out to be 1 plus nu by this expression which is very important where nu is the poisson ratio that is this stress itself can be represented in sigma 3 3 or sigma 3 3 itself can be represented in terms of a hydrostatic stress and the hydrostatic stress is nothing but 1/3 of the 
sum of the stresses acting in sigma xx, sigma yy and sigma z direction, correct. This also if you try to plot it, okay. the way this stress will turn out to be as the plot which you can see it is, it is essentially it is negative it value it shows which shows that this will be a compressive stress which is going to be here yeah, above the slip plane and tensile stress okay, below the slip plane. The only difference is that when we calculated sigma xx the plot looks like that qualitatively it is very similar to what we see for uh, uh, tensile stress x direction. But only difference which is happening is that if you look at the equi uh, uh, stress contour plots, these are all circles okay, where it is tangent at the dislocation line. There what is going to happen is that it is not a circle, it has got different shapes, correct? The values are different. So that is the only difference between this stress. What is the other thing which is important in this case? Okay. Then suppose this sort of a hydrostatic stress is present on the sample. Okay. We assume that generally we know in most of this material, okay, when dislocation is there, in addition to it, the other type of defects which are present are in the sample. Some interstitials could be there, which could be impurities, okay or we can have point defects which are distributed in the sample, right? Around the dislocation core, there may be some vacancies here. I am just showing it as vacancy. Let us just consider the case of a vacancy type of a defect is being present. And if a vacancy is being present here, when a compressive stress is going to be there, there is a energy minimization. But what we can see that if the stress becomes much smaller and smaller, if it can come close to the, uh, as it reaches the core of the dislocation, okay, this energy minimization will be maximum. It will try to reach that plus. Now the question comes is that what path it will choose? Okay. Is it that it will just like that it will come here or from here if it is there it will try to reach here? Okay. That is what is essentially important. This plot looking at it, we can get an answer to it. That is every movement which it takes from here to here, there should be a reduction in the energy has to take place. Okay. So that is how the stress has to get reduced. That is precisely what it is. Suppose there is a one which is present here it is with respect to a stress which is minus 2. From here if it moves in this direction it reaches minus 4 right and this is the way it will just try to reach this core of this dislocation. That is we can consider the case a dislocation is present when we do aging treatment okay. Some defects are present like a substitutional defect which is like a vacancy type. Vacancy type we mean that the atom which is there produces a strain which is essentially a, like a strain which a vacancy produces. Okay. And we know that when we do aging at that temperature, these defects come to the dislocation core and form atmosphere around it and in some cases they form a precipitates also around it. This we call it as a heterogeneous precipitation. But what is the path which it will take? to reach that core is given by these plots. That means that it is taking a plot which is almost perpendicular to this IQ contour plots, right? This is the way it will take place. Similarly, let us consider the case where it is an interstitial type of a defect. That is, it is, uh, I will just put it as a plus sign to indicate that it introduces some strain, positive strain in the lattice. So if it is uh, introducing a positive strain and if it is going to be there on this side, 
where essentially a compressive strain is there already. This will add to that strain, correct? But if that atom can be there anywhere around the lower half, the strain is going to be minimum, reducing the strain. Or it means that, okay, when one with a positive strain comes into a tensile region, okay, the strain energy which it feels going to be reduced. And if it moves further and further and comes closest to it, that is where the tensile stress is going to be maximum. Then the far, more reduction in free energy, more reduction in energy will be there, strain energy will be there. So it would try, try to reach here. But the path it will take is this sort of a path, something which is there on the compressive side. It will not just like that reach here. It has to move along this contour like this and it will be trying to reach here. Suppose we assume that it is being present here, then it will move along this path and try to come close to the core of the dislocation. That is straight away from here it cannot reach this point. It has to move around a path, okay, diffuse around a path and then reach the core of the dislocation to form. So the diffusion lengths are not like a crow flight distance okay and it's uh, going along a circle okay where that uh, the direction is normal to the equicontour plot so this is what essentially the information which we can get additional information which can get from this plot so like that many situations which we can think of where this sort of plot tells a lot of information about how different types of processes occur because of the presence of defects like dislocations. In this particular case, when defects have to migrate to a dislocation, whether it is in dynamic strain aging or a static strain aging phenomena which is taking place there, what sort of path the defects distributed around the dislocation will take okay, and reach the core of the dislocation or close to the core to form precipitates or atmospheres around them. That information we can get it from this plot. Okay. So, essentially what we have considered so far is the displacement field around screw and net stationary dislocations, okay. the strain field around them, stress field around them. Okay. What are the implications of the stress field around the screw and the edge dislocations we have done? Here also we have to understand that close to the core because in all the expressions which we have uh, derived here as the r becomes very small this value of stress can become very high because r is always in the negative right because of that beyond a particular r which that region of the dislocation we call as the core of the dislocation where the displacements are very high okay that energy calculation cannot be handled by a conventional continuum mechanics and there we have to do some molecular dynamic simulations to get the energy value. Some computational calculations have to be done. That is how those values are obtained. Okay. Okay. Now we have only, uh, we have got the expressions for stress and strain okay. and their distributions we have looked at it, some implications we have looked at it. What will be the effect of this stress and strain and the total energy of the system that is in a sample where no defect is present and if we introduce this defect, okay, how much the energy increase is going to or decrease is going to take place. This aspect of it we will cover in the next class. Okay. We will stop here now.